There are many legends regarding the case of the downed F-117 during the Operation Allied Force in 1999, but also many myths emerge regarding the steel capability and physics behind it. Even after 20 years, many of these myths and false claims are still spreading. Therefore, it's time to clear up some things in both areas. Before we get to the night of the March 27, 1999, it is necessary to deal with the radars and the physics behind them. Until now, I have been talking a lot about air defense systems and their radars. The detection range of the different radar systems were given considering the MiG-17 or MiG-29 size fighters and not their targets. Why? The answer is very simple. The Soviets measured these types as a reference because these were their own fighters. For this reason, it is time to talk about a very important factor that seriously affects the detection distance of the radars. This is the target's radar cross-section, in short RCS. How can we visualize the meaning and impact of an object's radar cross-section? Using a weak analogy, it is like the size of an object to the human eye. A larger object can be detected from farther, but an object can have very different sizes from different directions. A sheet of paper has far larger size considering its face compared to the edge. For airplanes, the difference is not so extreme, but there is a significant difference in surface area between the front and side view. This aspect dependency is also true for radars. Depending on the direction, airplanes reflect electromagnetic waves to a very young degree. However, this analogy is weak because the detectability of an aircraft with radar shows a much greater aspect dependence. Another major difference is the optical size of a plane with regard to steel design does not have any correlation with the visible area. Very simply, if I'm looking at a flat surface at right angles to the radar, if something like this were one square meter, it would have a radar return of a thousand square meters. If I move it back just about eight degrees, not very much, it drops from a thousand square meters to one square meter. And if I move it down to a very shallow angle, like about 20 degrees to horizontal, it's now down to one ten millionth of what it was when it was up there. The quoted video shows that even for a very simple surface, tightening it dramatically reduces the equivalent radar cross section. This is quite similar to the plane mirror and flashlight. The mirror reflects back only a fraction of the light to the emitter, however, it still does it. This example explains only the type of reflection from the many different kinds. Since airplanes are streamlined, they have relatively few surfaces that are perpendicular to the airflow. Consider a radar which scans from the forward direction of the airplane. It has a line of sight of only a very small flat or perpendicular surface area. However, if we increase the aspect from the side, the radar can see more and larger flat surfaces with a certain angle. These flat surfaces can act roughly as a mirror as mentioned in the previously given example. As the angle of reflection increases, the reflectivity of the flat surface decreases. What does this mean? A relatively small part of an aircraft can be responsible for a significant part of the reflection in given directions. Because of this, the radar cross-section is highly aspect-dependent and it is not a single value thing. It has characteristics. Due to this, characterizing the radar cross-section with a single value for an airplane has a strong reality distorting effect since it always and only applies to a specific direction and means only an average value with fluctuations. Here is a simpler and shorter form of this very important value. The radar cross-sections means the size of an object equivalent to the plane's perpendicular reflecting surface for a given radar. The causes and locations of the different type of reflections are on the image, but they do not act with the same weight because of the aspect dependency. This is why stealth fighter aircraft have a relatively conventional appearance. It is enough to look on the F-22 or the F-35 compared to the F-117. The most crucial part of the airframe shall be shaped by the stealth needs. Besides the necessary geometry, other technical solutions are needed to achieve steel capability. These are the following. 
the leading and trailing edges of the wings and the stabilizers, but as well the side of the fuselage, the intakes and the vertical stabilizers must have the same angle settings. The antenna of the PESA or ASA radar, if the plane has such thing, is tilted upwards to avoid acting as a reflective mirror. The view of the engine compression blades is obstructed to avoid the being in line of sight from radars. The engine intake duct itself is designed accordingly to reduce the reflection of incoming waves. The cockpit canopy has a very thin but radar wave reflecting metal layer. Application of radar absorbent paint. During service and maintenance, special attention is paid to the smoothness of the surfaces, the gaps between the airframe and service panels, and the fixing screws are covered. The most characteristic and visible part of stealth design is that such aircraft have internal weapon bays. All the solutions listed so far would be worthless if the aircraft carried external stores. Because of their function, their shape cannot be sufficiently optimized for stealth. In addition, stealth airplanes must be able to employ the same weapons as previous conventional combat planes in order to reduce cost. All the listed six measures are necessary, though they are not sufficient to achieve very low radar cross sessions by themselves. The miracle does not happen when, for example, radar absorbing paint is used on a conventional airframe. The essence of the special paint is further reducing the radar cross section which has already been done by the geometry of the plane with two free orders of magnitude. The painting is able to reuse the RCS in such areas where even the well-shaped geometry cannot do that. However, the special paints used on aircraft does not help much if the rotating compressor blades of the engine and the external stores still present a large reflective surfaces. The case is the same regarding the presence of internal weapon bays. Every intercontinental bomber and the F-102 and F-106 fighters and some strike fighters such as the F-111 and F-105 had them. Even if they had only carried the weapon in the base, the detection distance against radars would not have decreased significantly because the other necessary measures from the 6 point list are not fulfilled. Compared to conventional looking fighters, there are shapes that are more favorable to achieving a very low radar cross section. The problem with them is that the lift that they can produce and their fly performance are limited. Such designs are built from various basic diamond shapes. They do not have similar look compared to any traditional fighter planes. Using this method, the Lockheed designed the F-117 stealth subsonic strike airplane, which later became famous. It should be noted that in case of the F-117, only flat surfaces were used to create the shape of the airframe. The limitation of the computer computing capacity of that era did not allow using curved shapes. The radar cross-section of an aircraft prior to stealth planes showed a strong correlation with size. A smaller airplane typically could be detected from a shorter distance, while a larger one from farther away. Aircraft only with a very special shape had different radar cross-section from the usual. It was only by chance that the aerodynamic design of an airplane resulted in rule reflectivity and only in some directions. An example of this was the YB-49 experimental bomber, where the advantages of the flying wing design were revealed. Compared to the size of the aircraft, it was detectable from a surprisingly short distance with radar. This later led to the selection of the basic shape of the B-2 Spirit Bomber. However, the basic shape alone was insufficient, the special design regarding critical areas were still necessary. With the advent of stealth planes, a new era began. The size of an aircraft does not indicate the magnitude of its radar cross-section. Between the F-4 Phantom and the F-117, with similar made dimensions, length, span, height, there are four orders of magnitude differences in the radar cross-section in some directions. An order of magnitude means a tenfold difference, so here we are talking about ten thousandfold difference. Since the approach phase is the most important during air combat between fighter planes and anti-aircraft systems, priority was given to reducing the frontal radar cross-section. However, in other directions, the reduction is maybe smaller, but it is still significant compared to conventional planes. It is time to quantify what stealth capability is able to provide. 
I hope no one seriously treats the statements from anybody that stealth aircraft are invisible to radar no matter the circumstances. Despite the facts, many in the media nowadays make such a sensational statement. In fact, the question is the reduction that the steel technology package can achieve over conventional airplanes. However, to understand the magnitude it requires some mathematics and physics. The 10004 difference radar cross-section value mentioned in the F4 and F117 comparison clearly shows the relationship between the detection distance and the radar cross-section. It is anything but linearly proportional. For this reason, in radar technology, calculating with decibels using a logarithmic scale is generally accepted. The difference of 10 decibel means a 10 fold difference, 20 decibels, a 100 fold difference, and 30 decibels, a 1000 fold difference, etc. The reference 1 square meter radar cross section is the 0 decibel, so the value minus 30 decibel means a radar cross section of 0.001 square meter. The plus 20 decibel means 100 square meters. After that, let's take a look at this equation. This is the general radar equation. Don't worry, it won't be as complicated as it first seems. The left side of the equation is the receiver sensitivity. The smallest signal strength that the radar system can still detect in the background noise. Transmitted power, the peak power of the radar. This is also simple, the higher the power output of the radar, the greater the signal strength reflected from the target. Of course, for many reasons, this cannot be increased to infinity. The antenna gain is determined by the size of the emitted beam, the narrower the beam, the larger it is. 0 dB is the gain of the omnidirectional antenna. The size of the beam is determined by the type and the design of the antenna, as already clarified in the short radar summary at the beginning of the Berkut video. Another factor in target detection range is the operating frequency of the radar, which is important due to propagation loss. At longer wavelengths, the propagation loss is lower, but it requires a physically larger antenna size to form a narrow beam compared to a decimeter or a centimeter wavelength one. Finally, the last main factor is the target itself, its radar cross-section. This is a physical property of the target, but is aspect dependent. If all parameters are known, the detection distance can be calculated by rearranging the equation. At the end of the calculation, we essentially calculate the power of exponent m from the decibel values. If only the radar cross-section of the target is the variable, then only the 10 log o value changes in the equation. Therefore, through this, it is possible to examine the detection distance changing as the radar cross-section changes. The equation shows that the relationship between the radar cross-section and the detection distance is not linear. If this is the only factor, then the model can be interpreted more simply. Doubling or halving of the detection range is proportional to the fourth power of the change in the radar cross-section. Therefore, if the goal is to halve the detection distance of an airplane with a radar cross-section of 1 square meters, then the reflecting surface must be reduced by the 0.5 on the fourth power. This is approximately 6% of the original radar cross-section, more exactly 0.0625 square meters. If the goal is further halving the detection range, then 6% of this must be achieved, which is 0.039 square meter. Let's just assume a radar with 100 km detection range against a 1 square meter target. Then it is necessary to reach a value of 0.039 square meter in order to reduce the detection range of the given radar to 25 km. The reverse is also true. If the radar cross section increases 16 times to 16 square meters, the detection distance is only double 200 km compared to the target with 16 times less reflectivity. This relationship is also useful because if the detection distance against a target with a given radar cross section is available in a given mode of a radar, it can be calculated for a target with different radar cross section. For example, the fire control radar of the S400 air defense system has a detection range of 250 km against a 4 square meter radar cross section target at a very high altitude. What shall be the radar cross section if we want to achieve a quarter detection range? 
one fourth on the four power is one divided by 256. So with a radar cross section of 0.015 square meter, the detection range is only 62 kilometers. Due to its logarithmic nature, the detection distance of an aircraft with a huge radar cross section does not increase to infinity, but the difference compared to the conventional combat aircraft is nevertheless significant. Large targets such as the B-52 or a large cargo planes such as the C-17 can be tracked by advanced fighter jet radars in the sky background from distance up to 300 km. Meanwhile, a small fighter jet can only be tracked maybe just a third of that distance. Let's look at, at another variable. What if we wanted to double the detection distance with an identical antenna design by increasing the transmitter power? Since the relationship is logarithmic here as well, we get the 16 times that the transmitter power is required to achieve double detection range. I think it can be understood quickly that the main factor is the antenna design. The beam parameters are what the antenna is able to provide and not the transmitter power. This depends on the antenna construction and wavelength which have a strong impact on the propagation loss. The task cannot be solved by mindlessly increasing the output power, so to speak. The point, there is no magic regards to radars. There is not any radar with a long detection distance with a small antenna size. Reducing the propagation loss requires the use of a longer wavelength. The physical size of the antenna required to produce a narrow beam will be larger for the same beam width for a meter wavelength radar than for a centimeter wavelength one. That is why the centimeter wavelength sentinel radar looks like this, with a detection range of 100 km. Another is the target acquisition radar of the Book M1 system with a detection distance of 160 km. The radar is heavier partially because of its age, as shown by the tracker design of the self-propelled vehicle. However, the antenna is considerably larger and it is related only by the wavelength and expected detection range. The antenna of the Nebo M, which can detect from a distance of 500 km an average fighter plane, has size of two tennis cards. This radar is able to detect stilt planes at a range of 16-90 km. It is at least somewhat mobile, not like its predecessors, but its deployment time is still 15 minutes. The extremely long-range P-14F target acquisition radar of the S-200 long-range SAM system also has similar dimensions, however, its mobility is practically close to zero, it is theoretical. The minimum installation time is 24 hours. Compared to this, the Nebo M is a serious improvement, but it can be seen there is no universal magical radar. The size of the radar antenna is determined based on the required detection distance, operating frequency and radar cross-section of the given target, which limits its mobility. In addition, what is quite clear is that the radars nowadays can be lighter, they can have digital processing, but their detection range with the same antenna size has only slightly improved since the late 50s. The P-14F and the Nebo M have very similar detection range. The real improvement happened in the relocation capability and some other areas. What deserves a few more words is the issue of meter wavelength radars. The given radar cross section as a geometric value does not change depending on the frequency. The commonly stated statement that the geometric still does not work against meter radars is simply not true. The meter wavelength long range Soviet target acquisition radar could not track the F 117s from 100 km away in Serbia nor during the Operation Desert Storm. In addition, there is a phenomenon that is greatly overrated and misunderstood by the skeptics of the stealth. This is the really scattering. If a fixed ratio between the visible characteristic size of an object and the wavelength occurs, then the reflection is stronger. However, the size of different stealth planes are not the same and the visible length is aspect dependent. In addition, the wavelength of the rudders are also not the same. Therefore, the continuous, simultaneous occurrence of these factors cannot be expected. In short, the scattering has very little effect on the detection range, only some concerned even in an idealized case. This phenomenon does not make a stealth plane magically detectable from vast distances. More on this and other factors are presented in the Patreon extra content. In the radar equation, we have already dealt with the effect of distance, frequency and antenna design. After that, the analysis of the targets, their radar cross-session remains. 
the exact characteristics of radar cross-section of individual combat aircraft are secret. Typically, estimates are available regarding their values with the exception of one case, but more on that later. Since the radar cross-section has a serious impact on detection distance, it is important to keep it secret. Fighter jets of the United States and other air forces during foreign visits usually carry an annual reflector placed in the nose of the Sivender mock-up missile. This artificially increases the radar cross-section of the aircraft. With this move, the real characteristics can remain hidden. The F-22 Raptor does this masking by deploying a small angle reflector, so-called Lunaburg lens, on the belly of the aircraft. The S-35 uses a similar device as well as the F-117. How should the characteristics of a radar cross-section be imagined? The figure shows the measured values of the naval patrol aircraft Neptune. According to the figure, a magnitude difference can be measured in the radar cross-section between certain directions. Values between 10 and 20 decibels can be read, which means 10 and 100 square meters. However, since the measured value is low only in very narrow angle regions, it can be expected that averages around the middle value and the exceptionally high average are important. This is the region between the 15 decibel and 20 decibel, which means 30 and 100 square meter values. The detection range differs by 30% considering these as minimum and maximum values. Therefore, a radar with 200 km detection range against large planes always detects this target from a long distance, no matter the aspect. The fluctuation of the radar cross-section is irrelevant considering air combat tactics. What is also important is that in almost all cases the radar cross-section value is given in only one plane. This is due to the distance between the radars and aircraft. The direction dependence due to visibility from below and above according to the elevation angle is not displayed. The effect is negligible in most cases, it does not make a big difference. In the case of long search, the radar sees the aircraft at roughly the same angle within a few degrees. This is very basic trigonometry. When the target is close and the elevation angle difference becomes relevant, the distance between the target and the radar is so small that it makes the elevation angle irrelevant. Examining a target with an altitude difference of 5-10 km from a distance of 15-20 km has no significance. The stealth airplane can apply much sooner and farther its weapons against non stealth planes or ground targets. This is where the stealth provides a massive advantage over conventional planes. What about combat airplanes? What radar cross-session do they have in general? An incoming F-16 fighter in a head aspect case within a plus minus 30 degrees roughly has 3-4 square meters. For the F-15 and Su-27 we can find 7-10 square meter estimations, while the B-52 has about 18 square meter radar cross section. For the latest 4 generation fighter jets, reducing the radar cross section was also a goal, but there is only so much that can be done as external stores are significant reflective surfaces. In case of the Super Hornet, Eurofighter Typhoon and Rafale, the radar cross-section is roughly in the range of 1-3 square meters, according to marketing data, but this is considered without external stores. These later designed 4 generation fighters are sometimes called reduced observable planes. Compared to the first 4 generation fighters, the F-14 and F-15, they have roughly an order of magnitude lower radar cross-section. Nevertheless, they are not even close to the real stealth planes. This is fine, but what about stealth planes? Since the characteristics and values of low observability planes are secret, only estimates and numerical simulations made by enthusiastic university students, researchers and engineers are available. However, these are only informative at best, they should be treated with a grain of salt, or just better to ignore them. The only exception is the F-117, but more on that later. An official statement from the US Air Force in 2005 described the F-22's minimum radar cross-section comparably to a 30mm diameter metal ball. The radar cross-section can be calculated using this input, which gives us minus 39 decibel or 0.00012 square meters. In case of the S-35, the given reference was a golf ball size reflective object. Considering a sphere with a diameter of 43 mm, we got the minus 29 decibel square meter, 
or 0.0013 square meter result. The radar cross section of the B2 is half of that the F117, which means 3 decibel smaller value considering the nature of the decibel scale. This is minus 32 decibel square meter or 0.0006 square meter. These values are not to be considered holy scriptures, but they provide more than enough input for evaluating at least the basic impact regarding applied tactics of steel planes and their benefits. The radar cross section characteristics of the B2 show the results of the measurements of the scale model in the 1980s without a numerical value, but correcting characteristics. The measured results were smaller compared to the predictions, however the trend and nature of the radar cross section characteristics were almost identical for the modeled and the measured cases. Even in the 80s it was possible to make such an accurate physical model of an airplane. What is also very important is that the low radar cross section is valid in almost all directions except for the four spikes which are defined by the wing sweep and the perpendicular reflection and edge reflection. It is not known if the omnidirectional low radar cross section characteristics can be achieved with the shapes used by the supersonic steel fighters. This might be one of the reasons why the flying wing concept mixed with the ogive base shape by the B2 or B21 or the X47B with diamond shapes is used. Because only the measured results of the scale model of the B2 is known, it is not possible to make a solid statement about the nature of the radar cross sections of the steel fighters. Now we are familiar with the limits of the stealth planes and with the fact that there is no universal magic radar. The question may arise at this point, what is the essence of the stealth and what it replaced? Prior to use of stealth planes, the only way to dramatically reduce detection distance was flying at very low altitude. The effect of this was already discussed in the video about the Neva air defense system and the Moscow cruiser. The detection distance can be reduced to 35-45 km even in case of relatively flat terrain. This is done by flying below the radar horizon, but the line of sight blocking of smaller hills or even features of the terrain also can be exploited. This is a very serious reduction in target detection range if we compare with the 150-200 km range of many target acquisition radars in case of medium to high flying targets. However, this method has several drawbacks. Primarily, it greatly limits the range and cruising speed of airplanes because they are flying in a dense atmosphere. Compared to the high altitude cruising, flying at very low altitude can mean 2 or 3 times higher consumption. Secondly, without terrain following radar and autopilot, this can be only be performed during daytime and it is extremely stressful for the pilot. Finally, a fighter flying at lower altitude, especially in a ground following manner, is in an inferior position in air combat to the opponent who flies higher, who is already aware of the enemy's position. The only advantage of flying low compared to the stealth is that it reduces detection distance in a much more omnidirectional way from the point of view of ground based radars. However, this advantage assumes that steel planes do not have omnidirectional state capability, which is maybe true, maybe not. Against airborne early warning radars, flying at low altitude alone is not enough. Being stilt is much more valuable than against land-based radars. What is the point of flying at very low altitude? It may occur that a land-based radar is able to detect the targets for short periods even during terrain following flying. However, if these here and there short tracking periods do not provide enough time for an air defense system to identify a target, aim, launch a missile and hit before the target disappears again, then the target cannot be engaged effectively. Even if there is time to lock on the target again, in a given situation the missile likely cannot turn towards the target or already flown past the target. This is also explained by a B-1B pilot. You don't have to completely defeat the threat, you just have to momentarily defeat the threat. Buy yourself a couple seconds here and a couple seconds there. Therefore, the goal is to break continuous target tracking, because without it, it is not possible to destroy a target from a medium long distance with a missile because of control and kinematic limitations. In the video about the Neva and Moscow cruiser, it was already mentioned that the air defense system do not work in such a way when a target is detected, in the next second the missile is already flying towards to the target. There are many tags before a missile can be launched. 
On the other hand, the steel capability maybe does not provide omnidirectional detection range reduction, but in exchange it does not have to fly low. A stealth aircraft can approach its target at any altitude. This provides many advantages. Where we are speaking about strike or fighter missions, they can essentially fly above the engagement zones of SAMs with short-range infrared missiles. These small missiles simply cannot reach the flight altitude of the planes. One of the most important benefits, those airplanes can use the most economical cruising speed and altitude. Compared to terrain following flight, they can have significantly higher cruising speed, while their combat radius is also much larger. In case of fighter jets, it really matters whether a fighter jet flying at sea level launches a missile at a target flying at of 6-8 km or from the same altitude. Launching a missile from a low altitude to a high flying target, the engagement zone is about half or third assuming the same missile. If the state capability is not omnidirectional, the here and there case, which was true for the terrain for living flying, still can be achieved. The stealth plane, by selecting the most advantageous route to the target, can break the continuous target tracking. Now it's the time to give some exact examples. How much the detection distance can be achieved with the SNR-75 firing control radar in YB mode against conventional and stealth target? Let's consider an F-16 fighter jet with a radar cross-section of 4 square meters. The parameters of the fire control radar of the Volkhov are known from a previous video. 100,000 kW transmit power, 5 GHz operating frequency, the radar transmitted with a 7x1.1 degree beam, the receiver sensitivity is the previously mentioned minus 92 decibels. Based on this, the detection distance is 115 km. Ok, and what about when the radar cross section of the target is only 0.001 square meter? The detection range is reduced to only 14 km. Even if the radar cross section is larger with one magnitude and it is 0.01 square meter, the range is still only 25 km. Let's consider the smaller value. Taking account the reaction time of the Volhov system, in an ideal case it is roughly 30 seconds, but rather more, by the time the system can lock and launch a missile against a 6 km high flying, approximately 250 m per second, Mach 0.8 target, it can fly out the engagement zone depending on the flyby distance. The radar would no longer be able to track and complete the guidance of the missile. If the Volhov battery is the intended target for an aircraft, a low radar cross section aircraft can reach the minimum engagement distance before the Volkhov would even be able to launch and guide the missile to the target. If the detection distance is reduced by jamming the P-18 target acquisition radar or if the radar is completely suppressed by jamming, then the search with the fire control radar is almost an impossible task. This makes it much easier for stealth target to simply fire by next to a Volhov missile battery at a relatively short distance even at 10-15 km away. Even in case of weak jamming, if the steel plane arrives from the direction of jamming, it is practically cannot be detected until it flies over the S-75M SAM battery. In contrast, against the F-16, target tracking is possible from such a large distance that a hit is possible even at 55 km, which is on the edge of the engagement zone. Compared to this, the Volkhov could detect a steel plane only when it had long since flown deep within the engagement zone. Then the question arises, where should the line be drawn in radar cross section between the steel and non steel planes? In my opinion, steel capability exists when the detection and tracking range is so reduced that an error denial SAM system can no longer fulfill its original function. For example, when the engagement zone of an S200V Vega, NATO code SA5B, shrinks to that of a Volkhov instead of the 150 km plus zone it was intended to have. Aircraft with very low radar cross section dramatically limits the possibility of launching missiles considering the widely used SAMs of the 70s because of their very short target tracking distance and reaction time. This means that in the case of fire control radar of the Volkhov system, the maximum target tracking distance should be reduced to about 20 km, in case of the NEVA to 15 km. This is achieved with a radar cross section about 0.001 square meter. The F117 was designed against these air defense systems. 
while even the F117 would have flown low against the S200 or simply avoided it, since the S200 was essentially a static SEM system. However, more on that later. One of the main advantages of the stealth is the reduction of detection distance of fire control radars. As a result, some air defense system may be able to detect the given plane, but only so late that, taking account the necessary time to complete the task, they are no longer to able to act effectively against the target. The assessment of the tactical environment begins with the consideration and evaluating of pre-mission reconnaissance data, which ends when the threats are identified during the mission by the radar warning receiver or updated mid-mission via a data link. Today's planes are able to display the changing tactical environment clearly and easily on multifunctional displays. In a sense, the autopilot allows the plane to follow an optimally planned route, the pilot only has to spend his time managing the deployment. The navigational points can be even entered via touchscreen on the map or can be designated with cursor using HATES. This is how stealth can be optimized, avoiding the effective detection zone of the radars, long-range target engagement becomes impossible. The aerial denial SAMs simply lose their capability against stale targets. Such an operation is feasible for the S-35. The capabilities of the F-117 were significantly more limited compared to the F-35. However, about the limitation of the Nighthawk and the most famous incident about it is a topic for another time. If you liked the video, you can share, like, subscribe or ring the bell and follow the channel. You can support it via Patreon for exchange early access videos, voting on planned topics and extra content is available as well regular updates about the projects.